Uh, thank you everyone for having me today. My name is Dan Lawrence. I'm a software engineer at Google. I've been there about seven years and I've been working in the cloud and platform as a service and container and Kubernetes space. It's been very exciting. Uh, today I'm here to talk about uh, standardization and software delivery. We'll be talking about continuous integration and continuous delivery. It's one of the projects that we've been working on in the CD Foundation, where I serve on the technical oversight committee. Um, I'll be talking about the Tecton project specifically. Um, and I'm going to be starting out with some examples in security to help motivate the talk. So starting with supply chain security. We've talked about supply chain a couple different times in a couple other talks today. Um, but supply chain for software and why standards matter. So with this example here, um, we're going to talk about a uh, little quiz. So if everybody remembers what this clip art piece here at the top is, before the cloud and Dropbox and Google Drive, this is how people used to transfer files between computers. Um, if you found one of these on the sidewalk outside of your work, uh, would you take this inside and plug it into your computer and open up files and take any binaries and programs on there and run them? I hope that everyone's security teams have taught them well enough not to do things like this. You have no idea what's on that device, you have no idea what those programs are. Of course, you wouldn't want to run those. And if you happen to work in a data center serving production workloads, I really hope that you don't take this inside uh, your data center and run any programs you find on it. You'd be exposing all of your trusted user data, um, all of your production sensitive workloads to code that you have no idea what it does. You don't know who wrote it. It could uh, exfiltrate user data. It could delete data. It could buy cryptocurrency. There's a whole bunch of things that could happen here, and that would be a terrible idea to just take one of these things inside and run programs you find on. That seems a little bit silly, though. So let's compare this to normal software development practices. Uh, it, say you're going to write a simple HTTP web application in Node.js. Uh, the first thing you might do is install a package. In this case, we're going to use Express, a common one. If I would type npm install Express, you can see that this grabs about 50 different packages from 30-something maintainers and installs those next to our code before we even started writing anything. I think this is something like uh, 5,000 lines of code that we have no idea where it came from. So this really isn't that much different than taking a USB flash drive into your data center and giving it access to the root credentials uh, and trusted user data. It's pretty scary. Uh, without uh, being able to audit all these lines of software, and let's be realistic, nobody has time to look at five or 50,000 lines of open source code. We have no idea what's going on there. So basically, open source is under attack. These are called supply chain attacks, where people uh, get code into you through third party dependencies. And this isn't a contrived example. I'm not trying to scare people for no reason. Uh, real attacks like this are happening every day. Just last week, or two weeks ago now, um, ZDNet reported that 17 packages were taken down from PyPy, the Python package index. Uh, this was a pretty clever uh, two-part supply chain attack. The first one used a technique called typo -squad. There's a library called Jellyfish that's pretty common in Python. And an attacker uploaded a, another version of that package where one of the L's was switched for a one or an I character or something like that. So it's very hard to notice unless you look carefully. Type of squatting attacks are nothing new. Uh, they happen all the time. They basically rely on people to copy and paste something without looking at it. You're going to make a small error while typing a command. Thankfully, though, if you don't mistype one of these commands, then you're unlikely to get affected by this. In this case, the vulnerable Jellyfish package uh, downloaded a, a payload from GitHub and then executed it dynamically. And it was caught doing things like exfiltrating GPG and SSH credentials. What made this attack pretty clever, though, is that it was two parts. Um, the same attacker uploaded an another package, another set of packages. Um, the most common one is Python 3 date util. This package itself was pretty innocuous. It just contained some date parsing functions that worked in Python 3. So if you looked at the Python 3 date util code, you wouldn't have found anything wrong with it. The tricky part is that it declared a dependency on this Jellyfish library, and not the real one, the one with the typo inside of it. So if you just happened to scroll through its dependencies without looking character by character, you would have thought you were getting the real Jellyfish library, but instead you were running, uh, you were subject to remote code execution, and you could lose your SSH and GPG keys. <coughs> and there's lots more. This is far from the first time something like this has happened. I'm not going to go through all of these examples, uh, but there's a whole bunch of different techniques, and the creativity shows that there's no one size or shape for these attacks. And this is something that everybody needs to be concerned about today. Uh, Bootstrap SAS is one of the biggest ones here. This is a very popular Ruby library. Uh, the committers in this case did nothing wrong themselves. One of them had their credentials stolen. So the credentials to upload this package to Ruby gems were stolen, and an attacker uploaded a new release containing code that was never actually checked into GitHub. 
So if you looked at the code for that version on Git or clone the repository and didn't do a review of everything line by line yourself, you still would have missed this. The supply chain for these packages has a whole bunch of different points for vulnerabilities that can be injected. It's very difficult to protect against all of them. Uh, the one that I really like in a kind of sick and sad way is the Docker 123321 version. Uh, this carried out a technique that was basically a long con, where people uploaded a whole bunch of actually useful um, container images on Docker out when it first came out. These images were used for years. After building this use case out uh, for a whole bunch of time, they injected some code to mine crypto coins in the next versions of the images. So these people actually started out by building something useful, got it used, and then added code to mine crypto coins. There's really no way to prevent these things without actually looking at everything that you're using and being aware of. It. These were uh, live on Docker Hub for over a year before anyone noticed. It's pretty terrifying. So, how do we fix this and what does software delivery and continuous delivery foundation have to do with this? Well, all these things are attacks on supply chains. And supply chains uh, are basically how we handle software delivery. Software delivery is the process of getting our code from ourselves to our users. As an engineer, we, we like to think code is a great thing. We like to write code. But from a business perspective, code is actually a liability. Just like physical goods in a warehouse, things can get damaged, things can get broken. They don't actually add any business value until we get that code delivered into the hands of our customers. And that's where software delivery comes in. Software delivery is the process of converting code from something sitting in a Git repository to something useful that our customers can make use of and add to that business value. And unfortunately, uh, this Kelsey Hightower tweet says you can't really have a talk on uh, cloud native technology without mentioning Kelsey Hightower anymore. Uh, there's no single continuous integration and delivery setup that will work for everyone. Every company is different. Uh, these pipelines basically encapsulate a company's culture, what processes are required, which linting checks, which code review techniques uh, we have to use. So everybody has a different software delivery pipeline because they have different uh, business use cases and different customers. That leaves us in a pretty uh, sad state. Since software delivery is required and it doesn't actually add any value itself. We don't sell our software deliver delivery pipelines and everyone needs a custom one. We end up with these Rube Goldberg machines that everyone stitches together with bash and configuration files. Uh, getting something good enough here is more than enough in these cases. People don't maintain these, they're hard uh, to make portable. As soon as you get it working, you tend to call it a day. This delivery pipeline has all the data you need to start auditing your supply chain and figuring out what's coming in and what's going out and looking for vulnerabilities, but it's buried. It's scattered in build logs inside of Jenkins servers, inside of a git commit history. There's no real way to get things out of here. And it definitely doesn't scale when we try to take a broader view of software delivery in our uh, supply chain. So what do I mean by that? Like in our Node.js example, when we installed one package, we ended up with 50 packages. Because that package has dependencies, and those dependencies have dependencies. If you think of the supply chain for those, you're the user of one of those libraries in those packages, so they all have their own sets of Goldberg machines uh, that are used to deliver their code uh, from their developers' keyboards to you as their end user. I just stepped back one level here, but this really applies transitively to all the dependencies of our dependencies. These root Goldberg machines have all the data we need to start securing supply chains. Again, we can't access it because it's buried in different uh, file formats different specifications, um, and these pipelines can't communicate with each other. Let me take a, another example here and talk about a slightly different type of delivery pipeline. Like I said, I've been an engineer at Google for a long time. Google's pretty famous for doing things a little bit differently than the rest of the industry. Not necessarily better, just different. Um, Google uses a mono repo, which means we have one giant source repository for everything. Our first party code, our third party code, the source code for all of our tools, our production configuration all lives together inside of this environment. When we want to make use of a third-party package, we take it and check it into this mono repository in a special directory. And since we're one company that uses the same build system across all these libraries and tools, uh, we don't have uh, the kind of scaling root Goldberg machine problem. We just have one. We have one team that maintains most of this stuff. So we can write metadata in a standard format I say standard, I mean standard internally. This is something that wouldn't really make sense in the outside world uh, for every step of the way to a, a metadata bus that's queryable by the rest of the company. So this metadata bus kind of encapsulates the entire delivery pipeline inside of Google. This includes things like code review metadata. You can see who uh, reviewed every single change before it goes in. We can see what tests were run. We can see the results of those tests. And 
this applies all the way to production. So with this metadata, we can apply policy and do some pretty interesting things. So this is just some of the examples of the types of metadata that we have stored in this bus and the types of policy we can apply on it. We have provenance information. So from any given binary running in production, we can see exactly who authored the changes inside of it, and we can see uh, what changes are in each new version. Uh, we have metadata for the entire build process as well. Every once in a while, the Go compiler, the Java compiler, or a Python interpreter has a bug or a security issue inside of it, and the fix is to rebuild all the binaries from source again. So we can do queries in our production environments to figure out exactly which binaries need to be rebuilt and when they were last built. Another cool uh, feature here is that we can actually apply policy at runtime as well. So when developers build things locally on their machines and want to test them in a production-like environment, we can do that safely. Because developers can run their code in a production environment, but we have metadata about exactly how these things were built and signed. And so we can write policies and permission systems on our databases that say only things that have been checked in and reviewed by a certain number of people and were built using our you know, hermetic build system have access to our private data stores. Developers only have access to sandbox versions. So I hope I've uh, made the case so far that delivery pipelines, once we take a broader view, are the right place to start thinking about securing software supply chains, especially when it comes to open source. They have all of the metadata, we just have to extract it and get it into standard formats where we can start to make use of it. So we have this uh, kind of weird um, paradox where we apply all these standards and best practices and code review and unit testing to our code, all the first party code that we write. But when it comes to third party code, we, we kind of turn a blind eye to it. We trust that somebody is looking at it and when everyone trusts that someone else is looking at it, we often run into problems like those supply chain attacks I talked about before. Google has um, done a whole bunch of work in this area because we have a unique system. There's nothing special about that system. Um, anybody that spent enough time and energy on it can just set this up themselves. But the point here is, in the open source community, we shouldn't all have to do that ourselves. If we start to talk about standardization in this space and come up with standard formats for metadata and artifacts that we can query, we can start to build a shared metadata bus across the entire open source supply chain. If we do that together, then we can prevent everybody from having to waste time doing it themselves. So let's get into some more details about the standardization and what's missing and what's going on here. So uh, this is a data problem. Uh, all this metadata together across all the different software projects going on in the open source community turns us into a big data problem. We need ways to extract the data from the software development going on in the community today and make it available and accessible to the rest of the community. And again, this metadata already exists. We talked about it before. It's just in text files and build logs and git commit logs. We need ways to get it out. And that's where standardization can come into play here. And that's why the Linux Foundation is the right place to be doing this work. Once we start thinking about and applying best practices to how to audit open source, um, we can start to figure out exactly what metadata is needed, what formats are the best, how to query it, how to store it. Um, then we can define standards based on those practices. We can't do this just in thin air. We have to actually start trying to solve this problem in a few use cases first. And from there, uh, we can start to build tooling to make this easier. One of the great lessons of software development is that if something is not easy and not by default, then people aren't going to do it. If we don't have compilers that are automatically outputting metadata of what sources went in and uh, to a binary build, uh, by default, then people aren't going to take the time to do this. And as we go forward, we can keep repeating the cycle, pushing the industry forward. Standardization isn't necessarily the most exciting uh, piece of software development, but it is necessary. And that's what lets us build things on top of lower level systems. So we can get specific here. Uh, we need standards for a couple different things. Starting at the top left, uh, pipeline definitions. So everyone has these bash scripts and configuration files and you know, even documents checked in describing how software is built and released. Since this is in no standard format, it's hard for us to look at our dependencies and figure out which best practices they're already following. We need standard notations for explaining how software is built that apply to all projects and all of our dependencies so we can make sure that they're following the same standards and best practices that we are. We also need a software toolchain declaration as well. We talked about bugs in the Go compiler being found uh, that require security updates. There's also an old paper called uh, Reflections on Trusting Trust. Uh, that digs into this at uh, a scarier, deeper level. 
but just because you know exactly which binaries went in, or which source files went into a compiler and which binary came out, if you don't actually have all the source code for the compiler itself too, then you can't really trust anything. And this applies to the compiler that built that compiler as well, which is where it starts to get kind of scary. Just because we know something was built using the go build command or the Java C command, if we don't know exactly which version of the tool was used, then we can't figure things out. Containers help a lot here because they actually let us encapsulate the entire file system used in a build so we can examine it later. But we need other standards to declare these things as well to be able to apply policy on top of it. And down to the bottom left, uh, source providence. So this is where things start to get tracked back to individual authors and the actual people that worked on it. Git commit logs contain email addresses, but if people aren't assigning things or using DCO or other systems, then we really have no proof that something in a Git uh, history actually came from an individual. We need standards for how to attach this metadata and require this metadata to be attached on Git commits or whatever source code management system you happen to be using so that we can figure out exactly where, where things came from. If one developer was caught um, inserting backdoors and packages, it would be great to figure out exactly what other packages that developer touched. And then we need to wrap all this up in metadata formats that can be exchanged as easily as we can pip install or npm install things. This metadata needs to transfer with the packages, otherwise people aren't going to make use of it. And we need easy ways to handle this metadata back and forth between different organizations too as artifacts change hands. So putting it all together, um, this looks sort of similar to the Google diagram, except we need this in, for the rest of the open source community that needs to work with the tooling that we already have. As external software is built, we need ways to exchange uh, provenance with the artifacts. When we develop our first party software, we need to use those same mechanisms and we need to define the pipelines for these in standard formats so that we can share our best practices and audit the way that the rest of the software is built and released. All these development processes should be outputting metadata as well so we can see code review metadata, test logs, build results, and all of this should be in a standard community-owned metadata bus. So that we can apply uh, production policies as well. And that's where the Linux Foundation and the Continuous Delivery Foundation come in. Um, the Continuous Delivery Foundation was started up earlier this year. Uh, a whole bunch of founding members as a sub-foundation in the Linux Foundation. Um, I probably forgot to add some as members have joined over the year, but the growth has been pretty fast. Uh, Fujitsu recently just joined as well. Um, and we're very happy to have them in the foundation. The work there is organized in projects. So the Tecton project, uh, that I work on is in the Continuous Delivery Foundation. We also have SIGs, or special interest groups, um, working on uh, cross-cutting efforts. And the interesting one in this space is the Security Special Interest Group, which is focusing on supply chain security and trying to work towards standardization of some of these formats. So starting with the Tecton project. Um, uh, Tecton Pipelines um, is a project to start letting people declaratively specify software delivery pipelines. It's kind of the first standard that we talked about before. It comes in two parts. Uh, there's a way to declare these pipelines, and then Tecton also provides a trusted execution environment uh, to execute these pipelines in. So once you've declared everything as sets of containers that run um, in a DAG or a graph, uh, we can start to write metadata of every step of this way um, in a secure manner. We can do this uh, using signatures and various techniques to make sure that these things can't be tampered with. There's a whole bunch of other projects going on in this area too. Graphius is an API designed to store uh, metadata about artifacts. So you can attach things like vulnerability scan results, source provenance, build results uh, showing exactly how an artifact was produced and query them over a standard API. And Toto is another project in the CNCF that takes a different take on some of these concepts. Um, and Toto describes themselves as farm to table uh, supply chain security. That means uh, they declare, they have a couple different file types that declare exactly how software is supposed to be produced that can be exchanged between parties. So developers that have access to certain keys sign things as they execute commands, and then you can play those back to verify that things were built the way that they're supposed to be built, and things weren't tampered with before the artifacts get published. And then finally, some of the specification work going on. Um, there's two efforts. Uh, the SBOM, or Software Bill of Materials effort, is happening in the Object Management Group. And the SPDX project, the software data exchange, is happening right here in the Linux Foundation. SPDX is one of the most commonly used uh, 
SBOM formats for attaching metadata to software. Uh, it's been mostly focused on licensing data. You know, all of these concerns I talked about for security also apply to licensing. So it's a very common, uh, very similar use case. If you're pulling in code and you don't know the licenses about it, then you don't know that you're allowed to use it. Uh, the same thing applies to security. So the new SBOM, or the new SPDX 3.0 effort is focused on extending the specification to add support for security and provenance and authorship data. So how can people help and how can we fix this all together as an industry? Um, the summary here is that we all need to start taking supply chain attacks and our open source software security seriously. Uh, we can't trust that everyone else is looking out for these things. Uh, we can't um, rely on the community here. We all have to actually be, uh, take control of the software and our dependencies that we're using. And if we do want to fix this as an industry, this is a standards automation and data problem that we can all solve if we work together on it. We can't really wait any longer. These attacks are rising and happening more and more every day. And if this is interesting to you, then we're working on it right now in the Linux Foundation. So please reach out and get involved. Uh, thank you for having me today. There's some helpful links here for how to get involved and start contributing to some of these projects in this space. <laughs>